So let me clean this up. Uh, last time I talked about the final game, uh, the different choices, the three different tutorials that you can do, John Lennon's Haunted Jaunt, or the adventure game, or the tank tutorial, or of course, the option that I like, design your own game, uh, and all of the different things that have to be done here. Uh, I also reminded you that, uh, or I went through the lecture on game mechanics, uh, uh, the different primary mechanics of uh, different kinds of games, all the different mechanics that we had here. And I also went through environmental mechanics, uh, how we design our world, what it's like. Uh, and we had the different map layouts, uh, open linear and so forth. Uh, and I remind you that uh, in our final project, we include a documentation for with instructions for playing the game, but we also include an analysis of our game, what kind of game mechanics we used and what kind of map design we use. So uh, uh, think about these things as you're making your own game. Now, uh, back to the uh, implementation of different tools, I think I left off talking about waypoint navigation. Uh, I showed you a, a setup for making your own waypoint system, but I also pointed you to the standard assets, waypoint progress tracker and waypoint circuit scripts. Uh, they live in the utilities folder of standard assets, uh, and they are very, very cool in that uh, they, they, they do all kinds of great stuff uh, for you. Uh, uh, with this, we would set up a list of waypoints that we put wherever we want in the world with a waypoint circuit script on the, the parent object. Uh, we put these in the order that we want. Uh, we can move them around and have the uh, shape of the waypoint track uh, adjust automatically. And uh, the, one of the nice things is that both the standard uh, asset car uh, comes in an AI ver version that is designed for waypoint uh, following. So the AI car uh, lets us do things like uh, build up races of cars that uh, follow each other around. And the AI waypoint car is actually pretty smart in that it applies brakes when it comes to corners. And uh, it also interacts with each other uh, uh, in, in ways that are kind of interesting. When they, tar when they hit each other, they, they hit the brakes and do other kinds of stuff. I also showed you how to set up uh, uh, a, a humanoid waypoint system uh, using just our little follower AI. Uh, these guys just follow their waypoint target, those little blue spheres that are moving along the waypoint circuit. And uh, so uh, setting these up uh, is, is very, very simple. Turning on the gizmo shows uh, uh, what they're tracking and where they're, they are all along their route. Um, I also have uh, here in this scene uh, a, a bunch of AI airplanes. This also is in standard assets. The standard assets airplane comes in uh, uh, the kind you can fly or the kind that uh, uh, will follow a target. And in this point, they're following around a waypoint circuit here. I've got a little gang of airplanes and this one that I'm chasing with. I'm not flying the, the plane. I'm not very good at that. But the AI is following this waypoint circuit. And at some point here, I'll get close enough that I can turn on the gun 
and start shooting down the airplanes in front of me here. Uh, so, uh, and these are all waypoint circuit uh, followers. They're going around this track in the sky laid out by putting nothing more than four little waypoints in the sky and it makes this circuit then that they follow around through the sky so all very cool and all very interesting so let me stop that here and i'll stop this one here uh, and i'll open another one here that i want to show you um, so uh, the waypoint circuit, of course, we can embed in some much more complicated game here. And I'll show you this as soon as it comes up. Um, so here's my uh, here's my waypoint circuit that I've got on this elaborate track uh, in a in a fairly complex world with a lot of details and buildings and so forth. And it's a, uh, I've laid out this waypoint circuit track that goes around and I have a whole bunch of AI cars here that are going to race around this track. Uh, right now the camera is uh, set to follow the leader, whoever's uh, in the lead here. And I have a couple of different cameras uh, set up here. This, uh, this tool actually uses the Cinemachine camera, uh, uh, which I'll probably show you later in the semester. It's a, it's a fairly advanced camera system that lets you do a lot of stuff. Uh, you can you can follow close like this or you can zoom up to high and you can you can track from behind uh on this dolly cam uh that flies kind of like a helicopter around the world so the thing that you're noticing here on the left is i've got this leaderboard this is showing who's ahead of whom uh right now the Liga three car is in the lead. Uh, the uh, here's the that second car, the Mumati two, and I've got this whole list of uh, cars that are going around the track. And you might notice the little uh, heads up display on the car there that uh, uh, is showing its progress along the circuit that it's going around and what i want to show you today is how to use the waypoint system to determine who's ahead who's in the lead and the ability to put that on uh, a a leaderboard that shows uh, where things are here so i want to get back into my window here with the waypoint scoreboard so we've got these racers that are going around a, a waypoint circuit and we want to keep score and we want to display that on this scoreboard and so i start off by putting a script on an individual uh, the progress script and this script is going to track how far our racer has gone as it moves around the circuit. Now we want to be able to access the waypoint progress tracker and the waypoint circuit and if we include a using in here, this will now look at the namespace unity standard assets utilities. If I look down in here in standard assets and I look down here under uh, utility and I look down here under my waypoint tracker script, which I can't see because of that thing, uh, but the waypoint circuit is in a namespace, namespace unity standard assets dot unity. Now, if I were if I didn't have that using, I would have to type out the whole unity standard assets dot unity uh, dot waypoint circuit. 
So adding this, add, oops, wrong button. Adding this Unity standard assets lets me just directly access these. Uh, this is kind of like putting in the using Unity Engine.UI. Uh, that we do so that we can access uh, UI elements directly, the text, the buttons, and so forth. Okay, so uh, uh, with that and with the Waypoint Progress Tracker, WPT, and the Waypoint Circuit, WPC, uh, I can cache copies of those by finding an object of type Waypoint Circuit. Uh, presumably, there's only one in my world and getting the component on my uh, car, the Waypoint Progress Tracker. And I'm also going to access the waypoints, uh, and I'm going to pick waypoint number zero, the first one, and assign it to the position old point. So in update, I've got a, a bailout. If I haven't started yet, uh, uh, this lets me kind of hold the race and have some kind of countdown, three, two, one, go kind of thing. Uh, and uh, everything else in the update function here is nothing but looking at the waypoint tracker's progress point position. And this is, this is actually that spot out there where the waypoint target is on the circuit. Those little balls that I had in front of the character, those are the waypoint progress point, and we can get its position. And then I just accumulate the distance between the old point, which was waypoint, uh, waypoint number zero, and the new point, a vector, and I get the magnitude of that, and I accumulate that into the distance, and then I replace the old point with the new point, so that now I'm measuring the distance uh, between the next point as we move along our waypoint circuit. So this accumulates the distance that our character has traveled. Um, so I have a scorekeeper object that's uh, a child of our racer, and it has a little text mesh uh, that displays something that we uh, want to update with the scorekeeper script. And its job is uh, basically to cache a copy of the text mesh object, set it by default to zero, and then in the update function, keep putting the score that we currently have, the score that is a is set in a public function that's going to be called from some other script that uh, is going to pass it in what its current score is and also the name of the object that's passing it in. So uh, this, this is also on our player. Now, there's a central scorekeeper, uh, a, a central scorekeeper that keeps track of everything that's going on in here. I've got it on this canvas, uh, the central scorekeeper script. And what, what it's going to do is fairly complicated. This is, this is somewhat complicated. Uh, in exposed variables here, I have the uh, racer tag, the, uh, this is what I'm going to look for to uh, add to my score. Uh, I have a, an array of game objects, the racers. These are all of the AI racers that I'm going to find with find game objects with tag. And I have various settings for uh, whether I'm going to eliminate losers, how far behind they're going to be, and whether I display laps or leads. These are, these are some options that are set in here. So I have all these various arrays for the different objects, the texts, because I'm going to have a text for each of my racers. The text object is the uh, text object that it's going to be in. I'm going to be getting all of the progress scripts that are on all of the different cars. They're keeping track themselves of how far they've gone. Uh, 
but we're going to access those scripts from this central uh, 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 scorekeeper, uh, and we're going to have the distances and the order. We need to have the order of these things because we're going to sort them. So all of these different arrays, and uh, uh, I have a method for calculating the length of a single lap. Uh, this is something you only do need to do once, but basically this gets the circuit waypoints. It uh, sets up an accumulate distance thing, and it goes through all of the waypoint circuit points and uh, calculates the distance between each pair of them and accumulates that. And so this is now the total distance around the circuit. And there's some fancy stuff done here with the mod so that uh, my, uh, my zeroth one and my n minus oneth one are all connected. And so I get the entire distance around that lap. Um, in awake, I'm going to find all the racers with find game objects with tag. So that tag that I had up here that I set, uh, the AI racers, all of my cars have to have that tag and uh, we find them uh, with the find game objects with tag. Um, and I set, the, I, I make this array of order that I'm gonna use to uh, sort who's ahead of whom. So in start, I'm going to call that calculate lap length routine, and then basically just set up all of the distance, all of the, the different arrays. I have to make a new float for the racers distance, a new text for the racers text, uh, a new game object for the racers text objects. These are all things that are in the UI. A array of progresses for the different racers, each racer's progress script. Uh, I'm going to find the panel scorekeeper that I'm going to put my objects in, and I access the rect of that. These are all things that I have to fiddle with to kind of make uh, my UI uh, uh, kind of on the fly. Uh, I'm creating this UI on the fly. So I then have a loop over all of the different racers that I've found. I get component progress on each of the different racers and store it in this array of progresses that I've got, different scripts, uh, and then instantiate the different text objects that I'm going to have in my panel uh, uh, of, of objects. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm not doing all of the cars. I'm only doing 20 of them. So there's this number to display that is less than or equal to the actual number of racers that I've got. And I, I just parent them. I, I child them to the, uh, to the panel. And the panel, I believe, has an automatic uh, vertical layout that lays them out uh, appropriately. <clears throat> and then I start this coroutine updater. So this is all in the start. This is the start routine that sets up the arrays, builds the, the uh, leaderboard, and starts the updater coroutine. So the updater coroutine is, of course, a while true. This is this is uh, going to have yield statements in it that let us control how often it does the update. Because I don't want this firing every frame. I want this firing every tenth of a second. So instead of 60 times per second, I'm going to do it 10 times per second. So much, much less expensive here than having this in an update function. So I go through all of the different racers and I catch their current distance from their progress scripts. Each of the different AI cars is keeping track of how far it's traveled. So I have that in uh, the distances. Here, if I'm displaying laps instead of distances, I just divide it by that lap length. So this would show how many laps I've gone. And then I'm going to sort them. I'm going to sort those distances using a bubble sorter. And what this does, 
This doesn't actually change the distances. I'll show you that in a minute. It's not going to reorder the distances. What it's going to do is return an array of indices that are in the order of uh, that, that I've sorted them. And I will then use that order to display the different objects in the in the list. So um, uh, then I have a loop over the different racers. Um, first of all, uh, one of my options is that I can eliminate racers when they fall too far behind. That was one of the options that I could set. So I have to check and see if these cars are still active, whether they're uh, still running. Because one of the things I do here is if I am, have the eliminate loser set and my distance behind is greater than that distance to eliminate, then I'm going to set that racer to be false, set active false, and that turns it off. And then the next time through here, it's not going to be active in the hierarchy, and so it's not going to be updated. So, um, and there are different settings for whether I'm displaying the lead or whether I'm displaying the laps. So you can see here that order that I got from the bubble sorter, that is the order of the sorted distances, is what I'm using to uh, access my distances that I'm going to show in the in the uh, in the updated list. So uh, I, I'm going to go through the number to display, which is less than the total number of cars, just because they didn't wouldn't fit on the screen if I had 25 of them. Uh, and uh, again, I'm testing if it's active in the hierarchy, and I'm displaying the distance behind uh hi you got to settle down here settle down sorry uh but i'm accessing each of these by their order in that sorted list so i'm not accessing i'm i'm looping on i but i'm not doing distance i i'm doing distance order i so that's its order in the sorted list and down here, finally, if it's not active in the hierarchy, then I'm just going to put that the racer is out. They're no longer there. But otherwise, I've, I've put their distance uh, in that uh, UI element. Uh, and that closes out all those nested loops here. So uh, here's bubble sorter uh, that returns that sorted uh, array of indices order. And because I don't want to actually modify ARR, the array of distances that I'm passing in, I'm going to first make a copy of it into a local array, A, that is a new float of the ARR.length. And I'm also going to load order initially with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's uh, in the uh, un unordered state. So bubble sort works by uh, 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 checking pairs to see if they're out of order. And if they are out of order, that is, if AI is less than AI plus one, it's going to swap them. So I catch a copy of I plus one and put it in A, and I catch a copy of I and put it in temp, and then I put that temp into I plus one, and I do exactly the same thing to the order. So uh, this order is going to have the sorted order of my objects. And this is done with a do while swapped. So this is going to go through this loop until this swapped is no longer true. Uh, and uh, in the do loop, I set swap to false. But if I ever swapped one, I set it back to true. And so while it's true, it's going to go back and do it again. And it's going to do this until none of them get swapped, in which case they're all in order. So that's pretty cool. And that's how this whole toy works. That's how 
all of this setup uh, is done here. Uh, and uh, I've got, I have a camera that follows on a dolly track. This we'll uh, talk about when we get to Cinema Machine. Uh, it also has what's called a free look camera, which is one where you can move the mouse down to the bottom and it kind of tracks from a low and close and you can move the mouse up to the top and it tracks from kind of a high and uh, far away. And these are all things that you can adjust. The dolly camera can look at it from behind or it can look at it from in front. And uh, this, this Cinemachine camera is a really cool tool that uh, uh, does a lot of uh, really interesting stuff. And meanwhile, all through here is my list of cars that uh, showing how far they are uh, ahead or behind each other. Uh, this Karain 2 is 1 one hundredth of a lap behind it. And uh, there you saw as it passed two of those cars, I have it set to eliminate cars when they do one lap. And so uh, as, as these leader cars lapped the uh, slower moving cars, uh, they are eliminated. And, uh, and these AI cars are pretty smart. They slow down when they bump into somebody in front of them. Uh, and they do a whole lot of stuff that uh, that we don't have to fool with because it's just part of the system uh, uh, for the car. And I can move down through my list and look at all the different cars uh, by uh, pressing Z, X, or C. Leva, hush. Will you lie down? Hey, lie down. My dog's very antsy this morning. So let me stop sharing there and entertain any questions about uh, waypoint circuit systems and uh, uh, some of the different tools that we can use to access information about where we are on our list. Liba, Liba, settle, settle. Any questions? Sorry about that. No? Okay. So uh, let me quit this one. And uh, what I want to talk about now, whoops, let me get this other one going here. There's one other AI tool that I want to talk about here, and that's the nav mesh. Um, the waypoint system just puts a target out in the world that moves along this waypoint, but it doesn't, uh, the, the characters that are following the waypoint don't have any information about whether they're actually allowed to move in the direction that the uh, target leads them. And so they can get hung up on things. You saw the cars, some of them were stuck because they had gone off the track and could no longer get back or they were tipped over or something. And the nav mesh is a whole nother system that provides a mechanism for our AIs to navigate on a landscape and take into account obstacles and in addition, calculate the shortest distance between where you are and where you want to go. And so it can be a very complicated world with a lot of twists and turns, and the AI is going to find the shortest path from where it is to where you tell it to go, the target. Uh, it allows for uh, non-stationary obstacles that we'll see can move around and occasionally block the path or interfere with the way that the uh, AI is, is trying to go. And NavMesh is, on one hand, really simple. 
but there are uh, a lot of gotchas and it's a TMO in many respects. Now, the first step of using a nav mesh is to generate the nav mesh. And this is done by baking, kind of like we baked the light settings, we have to bake the nav mesh. And so if I look here in my little world, um, I have a navigation tag put up here. This is, excuse me, one of the windows that you pull down from AI navigation and it's a dockable window and I've put mine over here and it has a number of different settings. Uh, one of them is the object and this kind of is just a shorthand way of finding all of the different mesh renderers in our scene or all of the different terrains. Now I have no terrain, so when I press that button, nothing came up. But when I press mesh renderers, it shows me all of the different things in my scene that have a mesh that is something that's visible. And uh, in order for nav mesh to work, the objects that are going to participate in this nav mesh baking have to be set to be nav mesh static. And so if I look at the inspector for one of these objects, uh, say this cube right over here, uh, it's been set to be navigation static. And so all of the things that I want to bake have to be set to nav mesh static. And once I have that set, then I can bake the, uh, the nav mesh. I'll talk about these other settings in just a second here. So uh, uh, the agents, uh, the, these four tabs, they're the agents, they're the areas, they're the bake button and the objects. So the object tag is kind of just a shorthand to find all the meshes or terrains in our world and uh, uh, let us quickly set them to be nav mesh static if we want them to participate. Um, the, um, uh, off mesh generator will talk about later, that doesn't work here. Uh, now, the nav mesh areas, and I'll show you examples of these, uh, we have several built-in layers. We have one called walkable, uh, we have another called not walkable, and we have a third called jump. And these are built-in that are uh, kind of permanent areas, and they have a cost. Uh, there are 31 potential uh, user-defined ones there, in addition to those three, so you can make your own areas. And these costs uh, uh, determine how difficult a particular area is to travel on. Uh, when the nav mesh agent calculates its path, it's going to assign, it's going to read the different costs of the different areas that it has to traverse, and it's going to take that into account as it calculates the shortest path. So if you had an area that was a very high cost, it would try and go around it, but it would be able to cross it if it had to. Uh, the not walkable area is one that, uh, like the word says, is not walkable. The character can't traverse it at all. Um, so we can use this cost to uh, make a character favor a particular route that goes over uh, easier ground. Uh, but if there's no other way, uh, it will go the shorter route, or it'll go across that difficult terrain. Uh, we can assign this to kind of risk. Uh, uh, so uh, this can force your enemies to stay in dark alleyways. 
uh, or you can use it to uh, make your characters stay away from guards and patrol routes and other things. Uh, uh, and of course, you can use it as a damage area. You can set up an area where uh, uh, a, a swamp or uh, something that damages your player as they cross it. So the player would avoid those areas unless there were no other choice. So we assign those different areas uh, uh, to uh, our nav mesh. And uh, the agents, uh, uh, we, with this system, we only have a humanoid agent. Uh, the agents have a size, they have a radius, how, how wide they are, and that they have a height, how tall they are, and they have step heights, how big a step they can, they can navigate. This is kind of like the step height of our character controller. And they also have a maximum slope, how steep a hill they can go up, again, like our character controller. And when we bake, when we bake this, uh, this is going to uh, determine the areas of our baked, air, uh, our baked world that are less than this slope and have a step height uh, uh, less than than that area. Otherwise, they're disconnected. Uh, they 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 won't be connected. So uh, at at this point, we're ready to bake this. We press the button, and the nav mesh surface appears in our scene view as blue. If we have gizmos on over here, uh, we can also see it in the game world. So. Uh, that's that's the baking of of this setup, and and uh, if I just to show you here, if I make the slope really low uh, and bake it, uh, I I don't get any nav mesh up this hill because it's too steep. So I'll undo that and go back and bake it again so that I can actually make it up that hill. So. Um, now, um, the other point of this, uh, or the other part of this, is our nav mesh agent, the, uh, the character that is going to follow uh, uh, this pathway through the world that the nav mesh provides for us. And uh, I have a little character here. Uh, uh, the uh, little cube is the nav mesh agent. Let me get in the inspector here. And uh, all I have on this is uh, the nav mesh agent here, uh, a component that I've added to this. Its agent type is humanoid. That's the only choice we have at this point. And it has various settings that we'll talk about as we go along here. But we need to add the nav mesh agent to the character that we want to navigate. Um, there are a lot of settings, but the default values generally work pretty well. Um, the agent is defined by an upright cylinder whose size is specified by a radius and height. So if I look over here at the little nav mesh agent, I can see this cylinder uh, indicated by the, the green little lines here that uh, encompasses my character. Now I've set the radius to be 0.71 and the height to be 1.14. That's kind of just to make it a little bigger than my character. Uh, and I had to adjust the base, base offset. I had to move it to 0 0.5 so that the bottom of this nav mesh agent coincided with the bottom of my little cube that I want to have track around through the world. Uh, but those are the only fiddles that I had to do with this. The rest of this I left alone. Um, so the 
idea here is that the radius and height of our agent determines uh, where it will be able to go uh, on our nav mesh. Uh, the agent is going to keep a distance of radius or greater between its center and any obstacle or edge of the nav mesh. And in addition, it's not going to be able to go under something that is lower than the height of that property. So this can you can actually have nav mesh agents that can't go through a door because the door is too low. And you could have another nav mesh agent whose height was lower that could get through the door. So you can set up all kinds of complicated things with this. So uh, our nav mesh agent has to be on a nav mesh to begin with, otherwise you get some an, an error. And we have to specify how the agent is going to move uh, uh, along this nav mesh. And we do this with its speed, its acceleration, and its angular speed. Now, its acceleration is how rapidly it comes up to the speed that you specify. Uh, if you make the acceleration big, it kind of jumps quickly to its speed. If you make the acceleration small, it kind of speeds up more gradually. And the angular speed is how rapidly it can turn. And so we have to adjust these things so that our character doesn't go too fast, because if it goes too fast and its angular speed is too small, it can't turn very quickly and it won't be able to navigate the mesh. So these are fiddle features that definitely have a lot of adjusting to do. So I've set the speed to 10 and the angular speed to 120 and the acceleration to eight. And this is going to work pretty well. Um, so if I can get back here so that I can see the navigation mesh and I can play this, my little character is going to, oops, uh, I can't see the nav mesh here, maybe because it's, Uh, what happened to my bake? There we go. I lost that for a second. So um, uh, this is going to, I don't know why it went through that obstacle, but it's, it's following this path up, uh, finding its way up uh, uh, on the nav mesh, it can't go where the purple is, uh, and it, there's its destination, its target that it was going to, uh, and I don't know why it passed through cube number one. Why did it pass through cube number one? Oh. Uh, when I was fiddling around, I turned off cube number one's navigation static, and so you saw it went right through that object. So I actually have to go back here and rebake this so that it actually carves out an area around it. And now when I run this thing, it should properly zigzag through here, staying on the nav mesh and heading up the path and uh, getting caught in this little corner, but adjusting and then heading up towards its target. And you notice it doesn't stop right on the target. And that's because in this little nav mesh agent, I've set a stopping distance and set the auto braking on. And so when it, this is going to stop when it's 10 units from this thing and it's going to break automatically so that it stops. And this can prevent uh, a nav mesh agent from kind of circling around its target. Uh, you can get orbiting when uh, it, its uh, speed and angular speed aren't properly adjusted. 
uh, and that's discussed here. Uh, uh, so um, that that stopping distance and auto braking means that the when the agent gets within the stopping distance, it it will uh, uh, slow down automatically as it gets close to its target. And as it goes slower, its turning rate lets it turn in a tighter circle, and so it can actually get to its target point without orbiting. Um, so um, here's, here's a situation, uh, I'll save that since I've made some changes. Here I've added a different kind of object to my world. This is a nav mesh obstacle. It has a component nav mesh obstacle on it. And the thing about a nav mesh obstacle is it can carve out a unnavigable area around it. And if this object moves, the nav mesh automatically adjusts to have this unwalkable area around it. And so I've got a little script on this object that's going to move it around. This is a little move script that just moves it around. And let me watch the navigation here. So this time when my little character uh, tries to get through here, the nav mesh obstacle is moving back and forth and oops it closed the door before it could get through oops it closed the door before it could get through and so it's recalculating the route all the time as it's going along here and uh, so you can have these kind of moving obstacles these moving doors that uh, that let you uh, block the progress of your player or ai uh, you can keep them trapped in a room until a door is opened, all kinds of fancy stuff here. So uh, uh, next time I'll show you, whoops, next time I'll show you a click world here. Uh, so here I've got a, 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 a little uh, agent. Here's my agent. I can make it go over here by pointing and clicking, and I can make it go over here, and I can make it try and get through this world here. And you can see that it recalculates the path several times as it's trying to find a way through, and it's having a hard time of it. Oh, there it got through. And I'll show you also how to make that line that uh, indicates the path that we want to follow. So I'll stop sharing there and entertain questions about nav mesh and uh, uh and any uh, anything else we did today so any questions um does it typically take a long time for the nav mesh to bake no it's no okay yeah. thank you so it's not like baking lighting. It's it's snapped like that and it's done. Uh, even in a fairly complex world with a bumpy terrain that has a lot of areas that are too steep and a lot of buildings and yeah, no, it's quick. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's very cool. Absolutely.